everybody. What a privilege it is to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I love being in the presence of the Lord. We're going to we're going to jump right into the word of God. We're turning to Mark chapter 4, chapter 6 rather. Give honor to you, Brother Bonner. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity. I have had a great time in Michigan. You wouldn't believe the other night what happened to me at a youth rally. I, <laughs> I'm getting ready to preach, and uh, the worship service is going on, and I have a habit of pulling my glasses off during the worship service because I don't know you start crying and stuff. It's just not a good thing to have glasses on. So I took them off, and I always place them on my Bible. This time I didn't. I put it on my chair because I knew in my head that uh, I wouldn't be sitting down again. I was going to be, he was getting ready to announce me. And uh, the gentleman, Brother Gonzalez, takes the pulpit, and he goes through his announcements. And um, he says, you can be seated. This might take a little bit. And I just sat down. Right, right, right on my glasses. And, I, I mean, the thing is, I need my glasses, so I'm, a, I'm blind as all get out. I mean, it's just, and so I get up there, and he announces me to preach, and I'm like, well, first, I, I took off. I, I, I went to go get my glasses, and then I realized that uh, I didn't drive my car. I rode with someone, so that didn't happen, so I went back to the platform. He announces me to come preach. I'm so focused on my glasses, I get up there, and I said, uh, All right. Yeah. Now you can hear me. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I go to the pulpit, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about my glasses that are broke and how I'm going to preach with no notes here. And uh, Dad says I need to preach a little more that way anyway, so it's probably, <laughs> probably the will of God. And uh, I got up there, and I said, you know, I'm so happy to be in Indiana and then that, that, so that just made, so the whole beginning of the youth rally for me was just shocking. But thank, thank God that God can work in spite of the preacher sometimes. Amen. Mark chapter six, starting in verse forty-one. We're just going to read a few portion, a little bit of scripture here. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them and the two fishes divided he among them all and they did all eat and were filled and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes and they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men and straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people and when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea. And what have passed them? But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed that it had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up, verse 51, and he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. Verse 52, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. If you wouldn't mind praying with me for just a minute. Jesus, you're so good. Thank you, Jesus, for another opportunity in your house. God, we ask you to do a work that only you can do. Help me to say everything you'd have me to say, Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. Just deliver the whole counsel of God. In Jesus' precious name we pray. In Jesus' precious name. You can be seated. For just a little bit, I'm going to preach the storm is no match for God's church. Yeah. My Bible says that we serve a God that can do anything for anybody at any time. Yeah. I am thankful to serve Jesus who can do anything. It, the Word of God says exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask. Yeah. 
You know what that means to me? That means that there is no problem that is so big that I can't take it to Jesus and have Him answer that problem for me. There isn't a disease that's so great that He can't cure it. There isn't a devil so uh, big that He can't beat it. There's nothing that Jesus can't do. In fact, Jesus has no rival, as a song says. He has no equal. You hear some people uh, talk about Satan like he's Jesus is equal and opposite, and that's not true. He has no power that God hasn't given yeah. him, right? So he's not Jesus is equal. He's not Jesus is opposite. He's Jesus is lesser. Yeah. He has to come to Jesus in order to do anything. Uh -huh. In Isaiah 40, in verse 25, the Word of God says, To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Yeah. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. I love that. That means from the beginning of time, since Jesus, since God spoke everything into existence, there's not been one part of his creation that has stopped working like it was supposed to work. And yeah. until he comes back, the sun's going to continue to rise, the moon is going to stay where it needs to be. Uh, that's awesome. Not one faileth. And what's interesting is what Isaiah says next, and I love it. He says, Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? If you can, if you can kind of catch the tone of what Isaiah is trying to say, he's saying, Why are you walking around with your head down, acting like you don't know who the God that you serve is and what he is capable of? Yeah. He says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, Faint is not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. See, I get tired and you get tired. But the God that you serve, he never gets tired. He never gets weary. He's never done working on your behalf. He is continually working things out for you and I. I'm thankful that we serve a God that can do anything. And in our text, we read of, a, of an incredible miracle. One of my favorite miracles. We read of Jesus. He feeds 5,000 with just a few loaves and a few fishes. I love to eat, and that's why it's one of my favorite miracles. God, God, God enjoys feeding the, feeding the multitude. I love it. You know, the disciples, they said, send, send them away. And Jesus said, absolutely not. We're apostolic. We, gotta, we, need, to feed, we need to feed everybody. And so Jesus, Jesus feeds everybody. And, and what a miracle that happens and has God ever done anything for you? Yeah. If I were to pass the micro microphone around and I were to let you tell of God's uh, work in your life, I feel like we'd be here for a while because all of us have got something that we could say that Jesus has done on our behalf. Yeah. Growing up, I can remember just a few things that God has done for just uh, big moments in my life. I was around eight years old. My brother was six years old. And uh, we're, mom, we, mom took us to go get our shots. I hate needles, hate shots. That was not a good thing. And, uh, and she said if, we're, if we be good, if we don't scream at the doctor and holler and that kind of stuff, that she was going to take us to a store afterwards, this pawn shop that's right across the street from the doctor's office. So uh, long story short, we're able to go. She takes us to the pawn shop. We're ready to leave. And uh, it, it's a busy intersection. And my, my brother is listening intently, mom's giving the orders, and mom says to us, uh, whenever I say go, go. And all Matthew hears is the last word, go. And so he goes to take off. Well, me, the eight-year-old brother, I see what's happening, I reach out and grab his collar. And wouldn't you know, my crazy little brother just starts hollering like, I mean, it's, he thinks he's making it look like I'm abusing him, you know. And mom, she doesn't investigate the situation. Of course, of course it's Mark that's causing the problem. And so she, she lets me have it. Mark, you know, stop messing with your brother. Let him go. And so I'm just, you know, kind of, kind of fighting back at it. So I'm like, okay, whatever happens, happens. I let him go. And that joker ran right out in the middle of traffic. A uh, truck hit him going 45 miles an hour, knocked him 
way off in the air. He hit the ground. It should have been much worse than what it was. But Matthew today has got no problems. In fact, he's going to college right now. He was released from the doctor in only two days. They said it was an absolute miracle. It shouldn't have happened. While he was laying there on the stretcher, he said that just a six-year-old boy, I mean, it's kind of hard for him to make this kind of stuff up. He said he felt like a hand reached down and touched him and said that it was going to be all right. That's the amazing God that we serve. Little girl in our church, she was uh, growing up, she's jumping around her dad's house. Her dad's a big-time uh, hunter, and uh, he likes to hunt with a bow, and he had this broadhead that he... It's a really sharp arrow that he had somehow dropped it on the floor. Uh, to this day, he doesn't know how it got there. And his little girl is dancing around, and he just, out of the corner of his eye, he sees it, but he doesn't have time to say anything but Jesus. And this little girl, she's about four years old at the time, she's dancing around, jumps right on to the broad head, should have stuck deep inside of her foot, he runs, grabs her real quick. She's not crying, looks at her foot. There's nothing there. Picks up that broad head, and it's completely turned over. A four-year-old child completely bent that broad head completely to the side. She couldn't have done that on her own. That wasn't a faulty broad head. What that was is the power of Jesus. Because we serve a God who is able. The God that we serve is not like other gods. I love how Moses said it to the children of Israel. Almost his last statement, he said, before they go into the promised land, Moses said, our rock is not as their rock. He was reminding them that the God that they serve is not like the gods in the world. The gods in the world have no power to reach into our situation. They have no power to help us whenever we're in need. They have no power to pull us up out of trouble, to heal us from our infirmities. But the God that we serve, our rock, the rock that we have chosen to build our lives upon, the rock that we believe in, the foundation that we stand on is not like any rock that's out there in the world. I'm thankful for the God that we serve that can do anything for anybody at any time. And I love saying that over and over and over whenever I preach that Jesus can do anything. We've got to have that faith rise inside of our hearts. But what's interesting to me, as we're reading this, we're, we're reading what's happening. He, 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 he feeds the 5,000, a great miracle, and then Jesus decides he needs some time alone. And I love reading the Word of God for stuff like this. I'm an introvert. Immediately, my soul just cries out, Jesus, amen, hallelujah. I'm right there with you. He needed some time alone. He had to go pray. He said, I'm sending the crowds away. Sending the disciples away, y'all leave me alone. I need to go, I need to go pray. I need some, I need some alone time. And Jesus gets alone and, and, and he begins to pray. And he tells the disciples to meet him on the other side of the sea. And while they're out there, you know the story. A storm comes kind of out of nowhere. But if you do the research, you, you find that, that this particular sea, because of its geographical location frequently storms would hit this place it wasn't just it wasn't completely out of nowhere it wasn't it was it was kind of like a they had to be preparing for this kind of thing but it was an awful storm you know it was awful because you have to remember these are hardened men these are fishermen these are men that are used to being out there in these kind of elements and yet they were afraid for their lives this is not 2018 kind of men you know I mean, this is these are hardened men, men that are used to being out there in storms, and they are afraid. And the Bible says that it was the fourth watch of the night. That's a fancy measurement of time. That just means it's the darkest hour before dawn. It's sometime between 3 and 6 a.m. that they're out there, and they're doing everything they can. The storm comes out of nowhere. They feel like they're going to die. And all of a sudden, in the middle of their storm, in the middle of their circumstance, when they feel like they've got nothing left to offer, they look out in the sea, and who do they see but Jesus coming to them, Jesus making His way. Again, that's just like our God when we are at the end of ourselves. You know what I wish, and I've got to tell myself this all the time, Mark Stacy, don't let it get to where I feel like I've got 
nothing left before I ask Jesus to help me out. I need to just immediately start hollering out for Jesus as soon as I feel the situation turning. But Jesus steps on the scene. And just like he's able to do, he causes peace, says, peace be still, and it's still. And everything's right again. But what's interesting and what I'd like to point out in this verse, something that's it's shocking to me every time I read it. The Bible says in verse 51 and 52 that after Jesus stopped the storm, that they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. And wondered. Now, first let me just say, there's nothing wrong with wonder. In fact, we, we better not lose the wonder of the Word in 2018 with all the attacks that are coming against the Word of God and the people of God. We've got to hold on to the wonder of the Word. I don't want to ever lose that wonder I feel whenever I'm in the presence of the Lord or I see somebody speak in tongues for the very first time. That's a wonderful thing and we better not lose the wonder of that. But it's interesting what we see. Because the Bible says next, For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their hearts were hardened. The storm was so severe. The darkness of the night was so dark that they had allowed their hearts to be hardened so much that they forgot a miracle that Jesus had just done maybe within the last five hours. They had allowed something inside of them. The circumstances that they were in caused them to stop looking and stop understanding about what Jesus can do and only focus on their situation and their heart became hardened. And my great fear tonight as a young preacher, even for myself we are living in probably the darkest age the world has ever seen we're living in a storm that is great and is severe attacks on christianity happen daily attacking our values and the things we believe in and the things we stand on and i want to make sure in my own heart and in the heart of the churches that i preach at that we don't allow the severity of the storm and the darkness of the hour to cause our hearts to get hardened and to cause us to forget who it is that we serve and then what he is capable of doing the god that I serve is able to do anything for anybody at any time. I believe that with every fiber of my being that if Jesus ever healed anybody in the past that he can still do it again today even if the storm is great and even if the darkness is great he can do it again today if he's ever delivered anybody from alcohol he can deliver them today and if he's ever delivered anybody from drugs he can do it again today. There is no nothing too hard for Jesus there is nothing too great that he can't accomplish Amen. what we've got to do is we've got to hold on to our faith in him no matter what the storm causes us or attacks us Hallelujah. amen and the next part of this verse the the reading is incredible verse 54 and when they were come out of the ship straightway they knew him and ran through that whole region about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard that he was and whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch if it were but they the border of his garment and as many as touched him were made whole something got a hold of those disciples that night that hadn't happened before even whenever he fed the 5,000 it hadn't got a hold of them like it did that night but somehow in the severity of the storm and the darkness of the night the miraculous moving of Jesus on that situation stirred something inside of them where they got something deep inside that said I'm not just satisfied with what Jesus is able to do for me but I want him to do it for everybody 
somebody else. And they got out of that boat that night and they started looking for people that needed a touch from Jesus. That's what we've got to do in 2018. We've got to let the Holy Ghost get on us so great that we're not satisfied with just an ordinary move of God. We're not satisfied with just keeping it to me. But I've got to tell everybody that I know where they can go. I know where the answer is. The answer is still in Jesus. He said in his word that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He said great is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life eternal. It's the same way today. He is the only way. We have the only answer. And now is not the time for the church to back down. Now is not the time to allow the storm to affect us. We've got to determine inside of us, I know in whom I have believed. He can do anything. And not only that, He is on my side. Hallelujah. All I need to do is just ask Him. I've just got to take it to Him in prayer. Hallelujah. If you want to stand, I'm coming to a close. There was a young man I read about. I read about this young man. He, uh, he had this issue. He believed in Superman. He thought he was real. He had Superman lunchboxes, Superman outfit, Superman posters. Little boy, about eight years old. He, he thought Superman was real. And his mom, and rightfully so, he's getting older and she decides this is not okay. My young son cannot continue to believe in Superman. It's okay if he likes Superman. It's not okay if he believes in Superman. Because this boy really wanted to meet Superman one day. And uh, story goes, true story. I can, tell you the, I can tell you the author later that had this story written down. He, uh, he comes, his mom finds him and, and says, son, i got to have a conversation with you. And he tells the young boy, she says, uh, Superman is not real. I know how much you've wanted to, to meet him. I know that's your dream. Superman's not real. Hope that's okay. And uh, she was not prepared for the response that she got, ladies and gentlemen. That young boy, eight years old, just began to cry. Tears coming down his eyes. And she's like, why? Why, why, does this, why is it affecting you in this way? She thought that he wouldn't handle it too well, like maybe get mad or something, but not the reaction that she got. She says, baby, what's wrong? And he says, mama, you don't understand. If Superman isn't real, there's nobody out there big enough and strong enough to take everything that's wrong and make it right. And we are living, folks, we are living in a day, there are so many people out there that are looking for Superman. They're looking for somebody to take their pain away. They're looking for it in drugs and in alcohol and in all kinds of lifestyles that are anti-God and anti-Christ. What the church has got to do, we have got to start telling people that Superman isn't real. You can't find him out there, but we do have the answer. We know somebody that is real, that can do anything for anybody. His name is Jesus. We've got the answer. I wonder if tonight, I know I didn't, I haven't went long. I'm not a long-winded preacher. That's one of those things my dad does better than me. <laughs> He's an incredible preacher. He preaches longer, preaches better. I love him. But I wonder if we could gather around the front. And I don't know how y'all usually dismiss, but I think that it would be good just to kind of just to remind